via ECTT and what is the subtype? I've received multiple rejections, but the subtypes offered are not applicable. So that's that's a great question. Um, thanks for bringing that one up. Um, when you submit an annual report, you'll want to use the ECTD submission type of annual report. And then there is also an ECTD submission subtype. And there you would use the value of report. So each year that you submit an annual report, we treat that as a new regulatory activity. So for example, if you're submitting an annual report for the year 2020, you're going to use ECTD submission type annual report and ECTD submission subtype of report. For 2021, you're going to do the same thing again. Sometimes we get a question where someone has submitted their annual report, but then they find that they need to amend it. If that happens, then you would use the ECTD submission type of annual report, but this time the ECTD submission subtype used would be amendment. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, is the size of 10 gigabyte for ECTD files before or after the zip? How do we submit sizes greater than 10 gigabytes? The 10 gigabyte uh, file size is uh, talking about what it is before it's zipped. And when we talk about about anything being zipped here, um, that's the web trader interface for ESG. It automatically zips your file. Um, you, as the uh, submitter, should not be uh, creating a zip yourself uh, before sending it through. Uh, so the 10 gigabytes is, is how big your ECTD sequence folder is before any sort of uh, zipping is, is done. If your submission is greater than 10 gigabytes, you can still use ESG. As a matter of fact, we recommend that you still use ESG. We've seen submission sizes come in through the gateway um, as large as 90 to 100 gigabytes. So there really is plenty of, of headroom to submit these large submissions that way. Um, it's just that if the submission size is greater than 10 gigabytes, you have a choice. You can use the gateway or you can submit it on physical electronic media such as a USB drive uh, or a, a DVD. If your submission is 10 gigabytes or less, you must submit that ECTD submission through the gateway. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The final question for Mr. Resnick. For an existing ECTD utilizing DTD 2.01, is it necessary to create a new ECTD utilizing DTD 3.3 and resubmit it? Another great question. Um, as, as you uh, have seen in, in the presentation, uh, FDA will discontinue the old Module 1 using DTD 2.01 next year, March 1st, 2022. Uh, so we do expect that there are going to be uh, holders out there that are on the old uh, DTD version and will need to uh, switch over to the newer one. The good news here is you do not need to resubmit anything. Um, all you simply do is you, with that next submission, you submit it using um, the newer DTD, which is 3.3. And you can reach out to your ECTD uh, tool vendor um, to make sure that you have the latest version of the ECTD publishing tool. Um, that latest version should be using um, DTD version 3.3 as FDA has had that version available um, out there since 2015. Uh, but again, no 
definitely no need to resubmit uh, content that you've already submitted previously that would actually cause confusion for us if you if you did that. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next set of questions will be directed to Dr. Pham. If a company produces API and adds excipient for transportation or for stability purposes, is it subject to an API or FDF facility fee? Thank you for that question. Um, the facility question uh, will be subjected to uh, will be subject to an API facility fee, and um, you may refer to um, our most recent guidance um, titles assessing use of fee under good uh, generic drugs. Uh, use of the amendments of 2012 for further information. Um, once again, that facility is only a subject to um, an API facility fee. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, where can we check if the DMF fee is paid out or not? We may be having some connection issues. We're going to go on to uh, <clears throat> Dr. Hong for the next one and see if we can rectify those connection issues. One second. I'm waiting for my document here. And there we go. From Dr. Hong, the next few questions. <clears throat> In order to trigger the CA review, can the DMF holder pay the DMF fee with the DMF su submission prior to any ANDA reference. And also, after passing the CA review, can the DMF number be published on the FDA DMF list? Hello, uh, thank you for that question. And yes, um, definitely, we actually highly recommend that. Um, you can, uh, to trigger the CA process, you need to submit the DMF fee. Um, once that is paid, um, the CA process will be will start. And if you pass the CA uh, review, then the DMF will be posted on the readily available public list, uh, ready for reference um, list on our website. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, if DMF is only used to support NDA or IND applications, do we still pay a DMF fee? For that case, DMF fee will not be required for that DMF if it's only referenced in IND or NDA application. Thank you for responding to that question. This will be the final question in this session for Dr. Hong. Are DMF fees applicable to a secondary DMF? Uh, yes, DMF fee will be also applicable for secondary DMF if the secondary DMF is referenced in an A and DA. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. I'm just waiting momentarily for my question document to reappear. And we're going to try to check back in with Dr. Pham for another question. One second. I do apologize. All right. It looks like we're in order here. Dr. Pham, why does withdrawing a facility from self-identification not stop 
the facility from incurring the facility fees? Um, thank you for that question. That's a great question. The reason is because um, user fee and self-identification are two separate set of requirements under GDUFA. Um, a facility user fee obligation is based on how a facility um, is referenced in approved ANDAS or approved generic drug submissions. Um, it is, however, not based on how a facility is self-reported in the self-identification data. Um, so, for example, a, um, if a facility, facility A is referenced uh, as an API in approved and uh, 123, um, it will be subject to an API facility fee um, regardless uh, if the facility is present or absent from the uh, self-identification. Um, thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Our final question for Dr. Pham. Does a starting raw or crude material manufacturer incur a facility fee if identified on an improved ANDA? Um, that's another quite great question. Um, and the, the, the answer is it depends. Uh, we do occasionally see these terms being used interchangeably or incorrectly on the um, application form or the 356H. Um, the assessment to categorize a facility as an FDF or an, uh, or an API facility is based on um, the GDUFA definitions of an API. Um, and an FDF um, that uh, we'll discuss in one of the slides um, in our presentation. So um, if a substance produced at a facility is aligned with the definition of an API, um, it'll be subject to an API fee um, regardless if it was um, listed correctly on the 356H or not. Um, and thank you. Thank you for responding to those questions. Our next set of questions will go to Dr. Pereira. If the API micronization and sterilization is not applicable to a particular drug product submitted in an ANDA, does the ANDA applicant still need to list those in the 356H and 3.2.S.2.1? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. The short answer is no. However, if a micronization uh, or sterilization facility is listed in the DMF section S.2.1, um, you need to specify uh, in the LOA which facilities listed in the DMF are used to support the application. Um, otherwise, we consider that all the facilities listed in the DMF are supported uh, by the application. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, do DMF holders need to include testing sites applicable for characterization or data generation other than the facilities involved in release or stability testing? Um, no, that's actually a great question. So. Um, only the testing facilities involved in release and stability testing should be included in the DMF uh, section S.2.1. Uh, other characterization uh, sites involving characterization not uh, in the release or stability, uh, they don't need to be included. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The last question for Dr. Pereira. How does the agency determine if an intermediate is critical or not as this determination is needed to assess whether a facility is listed on Form 356H? Uh, that's a great question. So um, an intermediate is critical when the intermediate is not separated from the final API uh, with enough steps to mitigate the risk or the intermediate involves is uh, has complex chemistry uh, and also the intermediate route of synthesis uh, introduces the most critical structural features 
and the risk to the API cannot be adequately mitigated through the intermediate specifications. So if any of those are applicable, uh, we consider the intermediate um, to be a, a critical intermediate and the facility manufacturing this intermediate um, needs to be uh, included um, in the ANDA 356H form. Uh, thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next set of questions will be directed to Dr. Skanke. For an API that is fully obtained by fermentation, should the DMF be submitted to CBER instead of CDER by FDA web cradle portal? Right, right. So, so as, as Jonathan pointed out in his talk, the center to which you are going to submit the application that the DMF is supporting is the center to which you should submit the, you should submit the drug master file. Um, the manufacturing process to make the drug substance uh, shouldn't be the determining factor. It's the center that's reviewing the application. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, is module two required in ECDD format for the submission? And also, is question-based review acceptable for DMF in module two? Right, so, you know, we do not re re require that the quality overall summary uh, be submitted. Um, in the drug master file, uh, and um, if you choose to include it, um, you can use any format that you deem appropriate. Um, if you choose to use the question-based review format, that, that's fine. Um, it, we do not consider this a required element in the completeness assessment, so if the QoS is not there, it's not going to result in an incomplete comment. Thank you for responding to that question. The final question for Dr. Skanky. Can we file a single DMF for two variations of a same product having two ranges or limits and assays for two customers? Or do we need to file two different DMFs? From where would we get this in the guidance? Right. So. Um, under under the GADUFA completeness assessment guidance, there is a uh, sort of a de facto uh, requirement that the um, DMF contains only a single process. Um, but we do interpret that uh, to mean basically a single route of synthesis. Uh, so that there is room for process variation. And the, the variation described in this question, um, where you may have an additional purification after the synthesis so that uh, uh, impurities may be lower to support a different uh, type of product, that's the type of variation that we would allow in a single DMF. Um, if anybody has questions uh, along these lines of whether uh, a certain process uh, would be uh, okay for a single DMF, uh, you should describe that to us and send us an email uh, to the DMF OGD mailbox. Um, we do get these qu queries quite often and we uh, can provide you the type of guidance that you need to decide whether you need a second DMF or not. Thank you for responding to that question. The next set of questions will go to Dr. Danso. What does DLAPI and QDD mean on slide six of your presentation? Thank you for that question. DLAPI is the acronym that is used and it represents the Division of Life Cycle Active Pharmaceutical Ingredient. And QDD stands for quality due date, which is tied to the timelines provided to the reference applications. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, what does it, what does it mean that 
missing timeline means late response. Does it mean that there is not a specific time limit required? Great question. So for for the CRL letters that we issue to the DMF, uh, uh, that we issue upon the completion of a DMF, there are timelines that are specifically identified in the complete response letter. And we all have the understanding that those timelines do play a critical role in the review timelines of the uh, of the reference applications. So if you as a DMF holder are not able to meet the timelines clearly stated in the complete response letter that we sent to you and you submit your response post the timelines, then it is considered late response. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. It looks like we have time for just one more question. We'll see how this goes. And this is to Dr. Danso. When the timeline for the presentation of the response to FDA is not indicated in a deficiency letter, what is the timing to be considered? Great question. So um, if you receive a complete response letter and no timelines are delineated in there, and you would like to know if there are any timelines that we are following, I suggest you send an email to the OGD mailbox with your question and we'll do our best to get back to you. However, if for majority of the time, most of our serial letters that require a specific timeline to be followed do state it clearly in there. So if you have any clarity that you need, email us and we will do our best to get back to you. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Well, we've run all out of time. and want to give our, um, our panel and presenters a huge thank you for those great presentations and answering all those questions that came in. We'll now move into our lunch break and we'll resume and convene at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.